Shakti Pods here, too. The ancient yogic interpretation of mind and concentration is fundamentally based on chakra organization and its function. Kundalini is indispensably connected with it. Kundalini is vitally connected with the chakra system and the whole body system as their static background. Kundalini also plays the most important role in the spiritualization of mind in the development of absorptive concentration. The chakras indicate the levels of spiritual consciousness and of absorptive concentration. I think it's interesting he uses that specific term, absorptive concentration. Uh, the chakra system is actually a, su a system of subtle power operations around some centralized force. The chakra system is a natural dynamic graph exposing the exact picture of the constituent powers operating within it. Anatomical interpretation of chakras and nadis. There are various viewpoints according to which the chakras are nerve plexuses and the nadis are nerves or blood cells. The do Dr. Brahmanas Basu has expressed the opinion that a more accurate description of the nervous system has been given in the tantras than in the medical works of the ancient Hindus. The tantrika nomenclature has been regarded uh, as in anatomical terms, in anatomical terms, and an attempt has been made to explain them accordingly. According to Professor Brajendranath Seal, the Adhar Muladhar Chakra is the sacrojigial plexus, the Swadhisthana is the sacral plexus, the Ma uh, Manipur Chakra is the lumbar plexus, and the Anahata Chakra is the cardiac plexus. The Mani, uh, the, the, the Varishthana Varish, uh, Vishuddha uh, Chakra is the junction of the spinal cord with the Medulla Amblagata. And the Lala Chakra lies opposite to the uvula and is supposed to be concerned with the production of ego altruistic sentiments and affection. The Agnya Chakra belongs to the sensory motor tract and the different nerves of periphery rise from this chakra. The, main, the Manas Chakra is the sensorium and receives the different nerves of the special senses. The Soma Indu Chakra is the 16 lobed ganglion in the cerebrum above the sensorium. It is the seat of altruistic sentiments and volitional control, and the Shahashar Chakra is the upper cerebellum with the, its lobes and convolutions. So what he's saying now is not that the chakras are specifically these things that he's talking about, but what he's saying is that um, there has been attempts, he, what, the beginning, the introduction of this book is, is, is very thorough. You know, he's a, a, a Hindu, Indian scholar, until he's very learned in anatomy and medical sciences, things of that nature. And so in the beginning of the book, he takes the reader to be a complete neophyte. You know, he, he just, he just ignore, accepts that whoever's reading the book is someone who has no idea about chakras or anything, who barely has any belief in spirituality. So they say, you know, okay, so we're going to take the chakras to be, you know, what if this is just, uh, you know, some kind of anatomical graph of, you know, the blood vessels and the different, you know, glands and plexus and things like that. Um, so he says, okay, for that kind of person, we'll go through that and we'll show the correspondences and what certain doctors have said, and then we'll, we'll go, uh, he's going to go through and show how it can't be those things. And afterwards, he's going to talk about what the chakras actually are, which is, and then we'll get, and uh, by the end of this, as he's talking about what the chakras actually are and what they're not, we'll have a much more uh, uh, lucid view of, of what, what these amazing uh, centers are all about. Continuing, the anatomical interpretation of the chakras is basically wrong. First of all, an accurate knowledge of both the chakra system and the Western anatomy is required in, to correlate them. Usually, even a good Sanskrit scholar does not possess all the necessary information on the chakras, and so he is not in a position to make a comparison between the two systems. On the other hand, a tantrika yogi is generally not well versed in modern anatomy and physiology, and is therefore una unable to correlate them. The term yogi has been referred to yogin as you throughout this book. The yogi utilizes the knowledge of chakras 
in his yoga practices, and to do this, no anatomical knowledge of the chakras is, is necessary. But a person who has knowledge of anatomy and physiology, as well as correct understanding of the chakras, and utilizes knowledge of the chakras in his yoga practice, finds that there uh, cannot be any real identification of the chakras with the nerve plexuses. But this lack of identification does not interfere with his yoga patient practice. Excuse me. The yogis have been continuing their teaching, uh, continuing their practices in this way from time immemorial. The teaching uh, being imparted from the gurus and their disciples to their disciples, who will become proficient in time. The yogis, in absorptive concentration, when the outer world, along with their own bodies, are completely forgotten, experience a new inner world in each chakra. To them, the chakras are inner power phenomena. They are vivid and seen. They will not serve any purpose uh, of theirs to identify the chakras with nerve plexuses. This study has been undertaken not so much to understand this yoga better, but to find out whether the tantrika terms can be used to name the same uh, some physical organs or structures having no clear-cut names in the ancient Indian books on anatomy. Firstly, the main reason for this shortcoming is not due to lack of knowledge, because even in what we have, we find that they had great anatomical and physiological knowledge, but because uh, most of the works on the subject have been lost. Secondly, if we think that the tantric terms are merely anatomical terms, then they lose their essential character and specificiality. But first, we have to see whether or not this identity is possible. Professor Seal has identified the Muladhar Svanishtan uh, Manipur Anahata with the Kakajil Sacral Lumbar and Cardiac Plesuses, respectively. This identification is based on a lack of right knowledge of the real locations of these chakras. The chakras are in the Sushumna, and the Sushumna is inside of the vertebral column. So now he's talking about the Shushumna Nadi. Uh, and Nadi, if I'm correct, means a, a flow. Nadi is like a flow of psychic, subtle, spiritual energy. And the Shushumna Nadi is the most sacred Nadi. Flowing to the center of the body, it's symbolic uh, in the microcosmic sense of the river Jamuna, which flows through Krishna's Vrindavan. <clears throat> the microcosmic Shushumna Nadi close to the center of the spine uh, and as this person, uh, this, this wonderful you know, Swami, Shyam Sundar Goswami is saying in his book, the Shushumna Nadi within it contains this three more Nadis. Uh, the Brahma Nadi is the ultimate one of these three and this Brahma Nadi within the Shushumna Nadi connects us directly to God Consciousness gives us directly samadhi super concentration upon you know the the qualities the ishta devata okay <clears throat> where were we uh, no, no, no. the chakras are inside the shushumna and the shushumna is inside the vertebral column these nerve plexuses are situated outside of the vertical column, the vertebral column, so there cannot be any identification. Professor Seal says that the Barishtana Vishuddha Chakra is the conjunction of the spinal cord with the medulla oblongata. The upper end of the spinal cord is continuous with the medulla oblongata. The upper border of the spinal cord is at the level of the form and magnum. It is the upper border of the atlas vertebrae. It appears to indicate that the point where the upper end of the spinal cord and the lower end of the medulla oblongata meet is the Barishtana, that is the Vishuddha chakra. Actually, this description is not the name of the chakra, but merely gives its location. It is also stated that this uh, also comprises the laryngeal and pharyngeal plexuses. Um, so he goes on to, say, to go on to try to say and prove that you know, these are not the chakras, these oblongatas and such. You know, I, I've, I've heard, you know, Theosophical and other organizations uh, try to draw correspondence between different glands and different chakras in your body. And it might be the case that these glands represent physic physical correspondences, you know, to these etheric 
kind of chakras, but they're not the chakras themselves is what the point that he's trying to make. There's still another difficulty. The Vishuddha at the medulla level, medullary level, may clash with the Lalana, Lalu ch uh, Talu chakra. He has not identified the Lalana with any specific anatomical structure, but only says that it is supposed to be tract affected, tract affected in the production of ego altruistic th uh, sentiments and affections. According to him, the Lalana is opposite the Uvula. This means that the Lalana is situated in the Palatine region, above which the Agnya is the Agnya and below which is the Vishuddha. The Palatine region roughly corresponds to the medulla oblongata. It has been clearly stated that the Vishuddha is situated in the neck region, which corresponds approximately in the middle of the cervical vertebrae. Professor Seal says that the sensory motory tract that comprises the Agnya and Manas chakras um, this, oh, that the sensory motor tract comprises the Agni and Manas chakras. This statement is not clear. Moreover, he says that the Manas chakra is the sensorium. Seal also asserts that it is a sensory tract at the base of the brain. According to him, the Manas chakra receives the sensory nerves of the special senses coming from the periphery. According to him, the Manas chakra receives the sensory nerves of the special senses coming from the periphery. The sensorium gradu uh, generally is in any nerve centrum. Broadly speaking, it is the sensory apparatus of the body as a whole. It is the seat of sensation. More clearly, it can be said uh, that the Manas chakra is the seat of perception. But in what part of the brain is it actually seated, situated? Seal has, of course, roughly indicated that it is at the base of the brain. There are a number of events that take place during the centripetal passage of the nervous impulses from the periphery to the brain, namely stimulation of the receptors, transmutation of the stimuli into nervous impulses, nerve impulses, conduction of sensory impulses to the neurons in the brain, and neuronal transmissions and projection on the sensory area of the cerebral cortex. The whole chain of events is physiochemical, not psychical, in character. Recently, it has been postulated that the cerebral cortex is a way station from which the sensory impulses are finally relayed to what has been termed the centrocephalic system consisting of uh, mesencephalon, disencephalon, and part of telencephalon. It has no clear-cut anatomical boundary, but functionally it forms an integrated unit. It appears that both cerebral cortex and the higher uh, brainstem serve as the neuronal background for sense consciousness. However, it is here that a super physiochemical event occurs following or accompanying the nervous events. We can place the Manas Chakra somewhere in the higher brain stem. If the Manas Chakra is identified with a particular area or the center of a higher brain stem, then the chakra itself cannot be regarded uh, as the seat of consciousness. There is no possibility of finding consciousness in the brain substance. We cannot detect the mentative energy factor in the chemical and electric energy systems of the brain. The mentative energy factor. We cannot say that the neural activity itself produces consciousness, as it is not known how the change occurs. The findings that, the, uh, that lesions in the higher brainstem uh, cause a loss of consciousness do not indicate that consciousness permeates through the brain. The brain simulation activates the subconscious mechanism which relays impulses to the mind. The brain stimulation activates the subconscious mechanism which relays sense impulses to the mind. And as a result, sense consciousness is evoked. Consciousness, uh, where were we? Um, and as a result, consciousness is evoked, excuse me. Consciousness, uh, which is non-spatial in character, cannot be located in the three-dimensional brain. It has also been postulated that an intense dynamic neural activity, different from the low-level uh, activity of sleep, elicits an interaction between brain and mind. 
and under the condition, uh, this condition, perception occurs. How is this dynamic brain activity caused? The sensory impulses are not in this cause, uh, are not in the cause, excuse me, the sensory impulses are not the cause because they also come into the brain during sleep when no consciousness is evoked. The cause appears to be intrinsic. The specific dynamic brain activity can be explained as a neural counterpart of subconscious activity. Roused subconsciously to receive sensory messages, the unconscious neural mechanism is, so to speak, bridged by the subconscious mechanism to consciousness. Let me read that one more time. Um, the specific dynamic brain activity can be explained as the neural counterpart of subconscious activity roused subconsciously to receive sensory messages. The unconscious neural mechanism is, so to speak, and in the occult terms, this is something like sleeping dead thing. When we're talking about an un, we're talking about the unconscious in an esoteric occult sense. Um, am I still online? Okay, yes, I'm still online. Yay! When we were talking about the unconscious in an esoteric occult sense, um, we're talking about something alive, something which is connected to the to a great lunar factor, a great receiving of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, life and, 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 and uh, you know, patterns uh, of eros, if you know the, the, the Greek term. Okay, so where are we here? <clears throat> the unconscious neural mechanism is, so to speak, bridged by the subconscious mechanism to the consciousness. The brain-mind interaction indicates that mind is an entity lying extra-encephalically, but when a relation between it and the brain is established, the brain exhibits specific dynamic activity and is evoked subconsciously. Consequently, it is a mistake to regard a chakra as a nerve plexus or a brain center or substance. It is possible to demonstrate that the chakras are the different levels of consciousness and the subtle dynamic graphs, then it will at once be clear that the brain is only a gross outline of the inner power operation. Uh, that's pretty good. If it is possible to demonstrate that the chakras are the different levels of consciousness and the subtle dynamic graphs, then it will at once be clear that the brain is only a gross outline of the inner power operation. Professor Seal states that the Agnya Chakra is the center of command over movements. Hence, it is a motor center. The motor centers are in the cerebral cortex, but according to some current notions, the motor impulse originates somewhere in the higher brainstem uh, and is radiated to the cerebral cortex. In that case, the agnya is situated below the manas in the higher brainstem. The external location point is the space roughly between the eyebrows which corresponds to the caudal part of the third ventricle of the brain. Seal maintains the soma, or Indu chakra, is, the six, is a 16-lobed ganglion comprising the centers in the middle of the cerebrum above the sensorium. It is the seat of the altruistic sentiments and volitional control. These qualities are mental and cannot be a function of any brain center. It may be that the physical counterpart of, a mental, of the mental functioning in a certain brain center or area located in the teles, telencephalon. It may be that the physical counterpart of the mental functioning is a certain brain center or area located in the telencephalon. He identifies the Sahasrara Chakra, the crown chakra, with the cerebral cortex. This is a mistake. The Sahasrara Chakra is not in the Shashumna, but is situated extracranially. 
uh, 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 outside the head. It is more correct to say that the convoluted surface of the cerebral hemisphere is the material replication of the subtle nirvana chakra, which has 100 petals. Diva. The well-known author of Arya Shastra Pradipa, uh, a scholastic work on the ancient Hindu religion and thought, and a great Sanskritist, <laughs> has identified the Muladhar, Swadhisthana, Manipur, and Anahata Chakra with the ganglion impar, cochlear plexus, hypogastric, or pelvic presses, solar or epigastric plexus, and cardiac plexus, respectively. It is astonishingly astonishing that he has made the same mistake. The cochlear plexus is connected with the ganglion impar, situated at the union of the two sympathetic trunks at their caudal ends. The other plexuses are sympathetic. However, these plexuses are situated outside the vertebral column, whereas the chakras in the shushumna are, are in the shushumna, which is inside of the vertebral column. So these chakras cannot be identified with the nervous plexuses. <clears throat> the identification has been carried out still further. Purnananda Brahmachari has identified the shas. Shashralala Lotus, Shashar Chakra with the Telensiphon, Dwadala Lotus, Guru Chakra with the Densiphon, etc., etc., um, with all these physical things. It has already been mentioned that the Shashar is an extracranial chakra, so it can be identified with the Telensiphon, etc., etc., etc. So, Shamani and Umani are two power forms rather than deep concentration when Dhyana is about to be transformed into Samadhi, therefore they cannot be identified with any material brain structure. So he's going on to say that uh, all these people are wrong for, for identifying these things with physical structures, when in actuality these aren't physical structures in any sense. Um, so like I said, he knows his anatomy and he's very, very thorough. Uh, as he's going through and uh, making sure that everybody knows that these are not physical structures. Um, let's see. Yeah. Where would it be? So he says, you know, first, the reason that these can't be um, where these, this other person, Dr. Vasanji Rele, uh, says that they're supposed to be is because first the chakras are situated within the vertebral column whereas the nervous plexuses are lying outside of it so they can't be nervous plexuses because the chakras are inside of the shishumna in the vertebral column and uh, the chakras are inside of it Consequently, there cannot be an identification between them. Secondly, the chakras are subtle force centers and the nervous plexuses are gross structures. So this person has said that they're, um, they're all nervous structures, like nervous centers. So the nervous plexuses are gross and the chakras are subtle uh, power operations. It cannot be demonstrated that the powers residing in the chakras are also in the nerve plexuses by concentration and pranayama. These latent powers lying in the chakras can be roused, but these processes have no such effects on the nervous plexuses. So the correspondences can neither be ascertained scientifically nor are they in agreement with the technical description of the chakras. Moreover, Dr. Rele has identified the shaktis, powers residing in the chakras with the efferent impulses res uh, exhibit, ah, exercising an inhibitory influence generated through the subsidiary nerve centers in the spinal cord. The shaktis are conscious powers. He's saying here the shaktis, the energies in, this, in the chakras and the spine, are conscious powers. <clears throat> they act directly on any physical organs. So just, just just imagine that for a second. These shaktis in your spine, these shaktis, these powers in your shashumna are conscious powers themselves. These are 
conscious powers residing within your Shushumna Nadi inside of the chakra. These are conscious powers which can act directly on any physical organ. And unlike the nervous impulses, they never act unconsciously. So there's a difference. The Shaktis are conscious, and these powers in the nervous system are unconscious. The electricities and what are in the nervous system are unconscious. So they can't be the same thing. It's impossible that they would be the same thing. They control the chakra organizations, and the yogis arouse them to develop their concentration to the dhyan level, to be able to do dhyan on the deities situated in the chakras. To be able to do dhyan on the deity situated in the chakras. So tell me that's not bhakti. But this is an experiential mystic bhakti which opens your whole being to the Paramatma to glory and Sri Sri Radha Govinda Ji. Opens up your entire being to them. Not just you know carrying out these religious dry rituals, but opens your entire being through the very being itself in the core of the Shushumna, this is where your soul resides. This is your connection to Brahman, to super consciousness. So, they control the chakra organizations, the Shaktis, and the Yogis arouse them to develop their concentration to the Dhyan level, to be able to do Dhyan on the deities situated within the chakras. So Dhyan, is this great absorptive concentration. When he's saying dhyan earlier, uh, when he's saying absorptive concentration earlier, when he's saying that the chakras are different levels of absorptive concentration, he's saying he's meaning dhyan. These chakras are different levels of dhyan. Dhyan means meditation. There's a whole chapter in Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita on dhyan, chapter 6. And it says basically in that chapter that the yogi makes his mind like a lamp which does not move in a windless place. Uh, like a candle covered by a glass. The yogi makes his mind such that it does not waver in the wind. So dhyan is the super concentration. And we can have super concentration on these deities within the chakras. You can activate the powers in these in these chakras and it propels your bhakti forward. It propels your spiritual potency forward. And you can give better seva to the people. And you, better, you can give better service to the people because you're stronger internally. You're bringing more potency to the table. So it's never bad for bhakti to do any of this. And you'll find even Prabhupada himself recommends doing this, uh, you know, this pranayam and whatnot. It's in there. It's in chapter 4. Prabhupada recommends doing dhyan and whatnot. Go ahead and look it up yourself. Okay, so continuing. They control the chakra organization, these, these conscious powers. I'm going to read this whole thing right over again because it's just wonderful. The shaktis are conscious powers. They act directly on any physical organs. And unlike the nervous impulses, they never act unconsciously. They control the chakra organization and the yogis arouse them to develop their concentration to the dhyan level, to be able to do dhyan on the deities situated in the chakras. And which, which deity is situated within a thousand petaled lotus at the top of all being? Which deity is this? Of course, it's our Radharama, which are Sri Radharamanaji. He resides in that thousand petaled lotus. So if you can do dhyan, just like, just like, you know, instruct yourself to do dhyan on his lotus feet in your heart. Highness, where Krishna instructs, meditate upon my, my lotus feet in your heart in an eight-petaled lotus. Krishna is himself recommending this. So this dhyan process is very, very powerful. And eventually, dhyan becomes actual transformation, actual transmission. Transmutation, absorption. You're actually absorbed into Vaikuntha. You're actually absorbed into these higher planes when you do dhyan on them. So it's not just a, a concentrated exercise. It's actually a transmutation of your entire self into these higher states of consciousness. 
You have to make of yourself the higher state of consciousness. You have to match the vibration of Goloka Vrindavan if you want to enter. Or even if you want to just be in that place here while you're on the earth, you can still enter it. If you match the consciousness of Goloka Vrindavan, you will vibrate yourself into that place. The consciousness matches, you know, the place where you are. Where your consciousness is, that's where you will go. For some reason, in your previous life, before you passed away, your consciousness was in such a position where you had to come here. Or for some unspoken reason, you chose to come here. Either way, in this life, if you make your consciousness of the highest that you know always, and in the most highest that I know, is the Gaudiya Vaishnav, Chaitanya Vaishnav consciousness of, of ecstatic brain, so Radha, Radha Ramanachi, Sri Radha Krishna. If you choose this Ishta Devata, choose whatever Ishta Devata is, is most attractive to you. But when you have your Ishta Devata and you can meditate upon it within your heart, within your crown, do this Dhyan, this Samadhi, on the Ishta Devata, follow the process, how it's supposed to go, and you actually absorb into that realm, and it's an unspeakable experience of actually lifting into your spirit, your spirit body is actually traveling there, and your rasas, your emotions actually feel this place, and you attain knowledge and experience of this place, and it's beautiful. So, continuing, the chakras are the centers of pran excuse me, the chakras are also the centers of pranic forces, and specific sense principles. An alteration in the function of the body can be made by pranayama and concentration. The nervous impulses are physiochemical phenomena, whereas the shaktis are subtle and conscious. Swami Vivekananda has vaguely stated that the different plexuses have their centers in the spinal cord, spinal cord, a canal, uh, or, excuse me, that the different plexuses having their centers in the spinal canal can stand for the lotuses. The chakras cannot be explained physiologically as they are subtle centers and the nervous plexuses are gross structures. Swami Sachidananda Saraswati presents this in a more sensible way. He says that the nerve plexuses are not the chakras but they are the gross indicators of the inner regions where the chakras are. So this is what we were saying earlier. That the, 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 inner, the inner organs which may seem to correspond with chakras are the gross indicators where the subtle chakras are. And they, I, would, I would go on further and say that they bear on some special connection to certain ductless glands or physical organs as per, that's what the theosophists will also teach you. <clears throat> he says that the nervous plexus are not the chakras, but are the gross indicators of the inner regions where the chakras are. According to him, the ganglion impar or the coccygeal uh, plexus is the indicator of the muladhar, the hypogastric plexus, solar plexus, cardiac plexus, cardioid plexus, uh, and the cavernous plexus are the indicators of the Svarishtana, Manipura, Nata, that the chakras are the same. So the real nature of the chakras, Dr. Gananath Sen has used the, the terms Aida and Hingala. And now when we go alongside the Shashumna Nadi, they exemplify the great two. Uh, through this Hingala Nadi flows the Prana Shakti. It governs action, you know, uh, movements and everything associated therein. And the Aida Nadi, the Lunar Nadi, which flows on the left side of the body, uh, the Pingala on the right side of the body, the Aida Nadi uh, is the lunar center and it, the lunar is not the center, it's rather it's a Nadi, it's a, it's a, a circuitry in your body. These two Aida and Pingala nadis which flow alongside the Shashumna Nadi and create the three-pronged Trishula trident. They flow alongside of one another like a great circuitry system. Um, and the Aida Nadi is the lunar system wherein flows the Manasa Shako, which is the stream of your mind, the lake of your mind itself. So Dr. Gananath Sen has said that the terms Aida and Pingala uh, has used the terms Aida and Pingala to mean the two sympathetic chains of Ganglia and the Shashumna for the spinal cord. He has named the spinal cord Shishumakanda. 
and the medulla oblongata shushumaran shushuma shuriksha rikshaka. Dr. Rilei has identified the Ida and Pingala nadis with the two gangliated sympathetic trunks, one on each side of the vertebral column, and the Shushumna nadi with the spinal cord. Professor Brajendranath Seal has identified the Ida and Pingala nadi with the left and right gangliated sympathetic trucks, with the Shushumna nadi in the central canal of the spinal cord, uh, and with the Shushumna nadi, uh, uh, but the Shushumna nadi with the central canal uh, of the spinal cord. According to the printed on the Brahmachari, the Shushumna is the spinal cord, and the Brahma Rand, the Brahma Nadi, is identical with the central canal. Uh, so the Brahma Rand is on the top of the head, and this is the Brahma Nadi. Um, uh, well, I've, I've read in the Theosophical text that it's on the top of the head, but if it's the Brahma Nadi, as they say here, then I believe it also extends into the Muladhara Chakra. Either way, Lulagananda says that the Ida and Pingala are the sensory and motor fibers in the spinal cord. So that's interesting, and that's exactly the, um, you can learn a lot just by what he's talking about here. This is exactly the dynamic, and I'm about to uh, release like a, um, I'm working on a workshop based on this dynamic of, uh, of, of, of sun and moon of sensory and motor, as it's saying here, as an internal and externalizing uh, process. There's one internalizing process and one externalizing process. And the internalizing process is Gyan and uh, uh, Rajo Yoga, or this Laya Yoga like we're doing, uh, or talking about any, or reading about, some of us are doing. And the other uh, externalizing process is bhakti or karma. So you look at the different, the four yogas, two of them are internalizing processes, and two of them are externalizing processes. Right? So you have the external and internal, sun and moon. Um, and so uh, the, the sensory and uh, Vivekananda has identified the Ida and Pingala with the sensory and motor fibers, meaning one is. Sensory internalizing process, motor externalizing process in the spinal cord through which the different, the afferent and efferent currents travel. So here we have this again, this, this theme of affer uh, afferent and efferent internalizing, externalizing, yin, yang, sun, moon. So the sensory and motor impulses in the spinal cord have been identified with the Ida and Pingala nadis respectively. About the Shushumna, he says that it is a hollow canal running centrally through the spinal cord, and the canal is continuous with the bone, uh, with the uh, fine fiber, which starts at the end of the spinal cord and goes downward uh, to the lower uh, end, situated near the sacral plexus. This fiber is clearly the phylum terminale. From this description, it appears that he has identified the Shushumna with the central canal within which there is no nerve matter, but it contains the cerebrospinal fluid. According to him, the mind is able to send messages without any wire, that is, uh, without passing through the nerves. And this is uh, done when the yogi makes the current pass through the shushumna. So when sometimes he calls the shushumna as a type of like a wireless transmitting force. Um, and I would say that this is because the Shushumna Nadi is connected to the Brahma Nadi. And Brahma is all that is. So the material world may look like it's very much distant and far apart from every, everything is located far apart. So how can I send a transmission from here to, you know, to Alpha Centauri in a, in a nanosecond? Well, actually, it may look far apart, but everything is Brahma. Everything is... This, 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 uh, Paramatma, right? And so, there really is no different distance between anything and anything else. And this is why the ancient yogis are able to teleport, uh, augment their, their sizes higher and lower and whatnot. Because everything is really the Paramatma. Everything is really based on the Paramatma, anything else. So, one can teleport here, there, eyes smaller, larger. Um, and so the Shushumna Nadi, which connects one to the Brahma Nadi, is a type of quote-unquote wireless uh, 
as, as this guy will, will call it, uh, energy, you know, or uh, connective uh, uh, energy or force. Now let us first consider whether we are justified in identifying the Shashumna with the spinal cord. First, the Shashumna Nadi has been uh, described as extremely subtle and spiral. But the spinal cord is a gross nervous structure measuring in width uh, at the level of cervical enlargement uh, 13 to 14 uh, millimeters of the lumbosacral enlargement da -da -da, uh, 11 to 13 millimeters and of the thoracic portion 10 millimeters. Consequently, there cannot be an identification between the two. Secondly, the Shashumna Nadi arises from the Nadi center called Kandamula, lying just below the Muladhara Chakra, which corresponds approximately with the point below the inferior end of the Philum Terminale. It ascends through the Philum Terminale, central canal, fourth ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, third ventricle, telencephalon medium, anterior commissure, fornix, septum pellis, pellucidium, corpus callosum and longitudinal, longitudinal fissure to reach the central point of the cerebral cortex. On the other hand, the spinal cord extends from the lower border of the first lumbar vertebrae to the upper border of the atlas and it ends in the lower part of the medulla oblongata at the level of the foramen magnum. From this, it is clear that the shashumna cannot be identified with the spinal cord. There's another important uh, note uh, point which needs our attention. Inside the Shushumna are three more nadis. So here he's talking about it. Inside the Shushumna nadi are three more nadis. Within the Shushumna nadi is the Vajra. Vajra means thunderbolt or diamond. You know that a diamond pierces through anything. Uh, it can only be pierced, only be cut by another diamond. Within the Shashumna is the Vajra. Within the Vajra is the Chitrini. And within the Chitrini is the Brahma Nadi. So these are three Nadis within the Shashumna Nadi itself. If the Shashumna is the spinal cord, how are these three Nadis to be explained? Can the Vajra, Chitrini, and Brahma Nadis stand for the white matter, gray matter, and central canal respectively? Or should these three nadis be identified with the meninges, white matter, and gray matter? Uh, the meninges is also consists of three layers, dura matter, arachnoid matter, and pia matter. Here we can really, here we really do not know what to think. The nadi can stand for the white, the nadi can stand for the white or gray matter, but it cannot identify with either of the meninges or the central canal, neither of which is composed of nervous tissue. Dr. Gunanath said has exclusively used the word nadi to signify nerves. He also used, uh, says that the Greek word neuron, a nerve, is derived from the Sanskrit word nadi. Professor Prajendranath Seal appears to have the same opinion. Dr. Rele also has the same opinion. He says, uh, Why you nadis, i.e. nerves of impulse? Uh, he has clearly identified why you with nervous impulse. <laughs> the Greek word neuron means sinew, cord, and nerve. Now this word is used to mean a nerve cell with its axonal and dendritic processes. And it is considered to be the central to be the structural unit of the nervous system. The word nerve has many meanings, but from the medical viewpoint, a nerve is a tubular elongated structure consisting of bundles of nerve fibers or axons of nerve cells which convey impulses in a connective tissue sheath called the um, uh, da -da 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 -da. So he's just going on and on to, to thoroughly pound the point home that the chakras are not nerve, nervous things, and they're not physical in any sense, they're subtle. So he says that the Ida and Pingala Nadis cannot be identified with the sensory and motor impulses um, because they are not gross nerve fibers it's to the mind and body. Mind. 
and the Pingala Nadi conveys these forces to your body. Prana Shakti and Manasa Shako. Uh, okay, so now we have the yogic explanation of the chakras, and here's where it gets really good. There are no indications of the chakras either in the gross aspect of the body or the molecular and atomic levels. Are we then forced to conclude that the chakras belong to the realm of non-entities? Another important question is linked with the answer given to this question, namely, is the modern scientific conception of matter the borderland of our knowledge? At one level, matter, in a se matter is seen in its gross form, and another level is constituted of minute particles and energy. Here we find the conversion of matter into energy and energy into matter. This may explain how materiality, the materiality of matter is maintained, but is not enough to account for how the manifestation of life in matter and connection uh, cannot for the manifestation of life in matter and the connection of mind with the brain. We cannot escape by simply saying that protoplasm is the living matter and the mind is a function of the brain. The elementary particles are very minute. They are also, they're all so small that they are not even seen with the help of sen most sensitive instruments. But they still have mass, and theoretically it is possible to reduce mass step by step to a point where there is no longer any mass. According to Kannada, this is the stage of Anu, a non-magnitudinous point. The nearest approach to Anu is seen in the neutrino. Uh, let's see, uh, a neutrino, which has no mass, no charge, and a very slight interaction with matter. This indicates that there is a possibility of energy becoming free from the bondage of the particles in a graduated manner. So this is the fundamental background of this philosophy of Laya Yoga, that the particles, your body, can be used like the kindling of a fire of sacrifice, a sacrificial fire, which burns up everything, which frees your body from the actual matter by you, means of this transmutive effect. It transmutes it from physical matter to energy. Your body becomes almost pure energy. You just feel yourself radiating. You just feel yourself sitting in this amazing ocean of, of shaktis. Okay, so we're into new. In this transition period, certain particles may pass into the stage of Anu. So he says this indicates there's a possibility of energy being free from matter. E equals MC squared. In this transition period, a certain graduated uh, certain particles may pass into the stage of Anu where there are only energy, energy without any material form and free from matter bondage. This is subtle energy. Where does it go? It is not returned to the material field, as it cannot function there. It is not destroyed, then it must have a field of operation. So using materialist's own science, you can prove the subtle realm exists. It is not returned to the material field, it cannot function there. It is not destroyed, then it must have a field of operation. This has been turned by the, the yogis, the subtle power field. The subtle power field. And that's probably the same thing as the what we call in the West, the aura, I believe. The aura. The yogis explain that in the following manner, this in the following manner, the decentralized subtle forces, named technically termed Mahabhutas, metamatter, pass to a level called elliptical body kandamula called, uh, where they are equalized to form an undifferentiated metamatter force at this point metamatter force tends towards grossness uh, and materialization on a descending scale, and finally it is transformed into material energy which operates in the material field. Material energy undergoes fragmentation. It is the process of transformation of energy.
first, um, into just a trace of minute matter fragments which at a certain stage on the descending scale appear as elementary particles. On a descending scale appear as elementary particles. And second, into atoms and molecules and finally into gross matter. At the gross level, matter exhibits specific sense qualities derived from five forms of tanan, tan matra, associated with metamatter forces which react on the physical senses. On the other hand, when energy becomes free from particles at the energy level of matter, a part of it may break the bondage of matter due to the activation of the latent metamatter force, the outer expression of which is material energy, and becomes transformed into metamatter force to function in the subtle power fields. So now here he's describing the actual transmutive process of the alchemization of energy into your aura. And this power, as it surges through the chakras of your body, igniting absorptive concentration upon the great deities which represent these archetypal dimensions of consciousness dwelling within and all around you. This is the great absorption into the macrocosm. The microcosm is catching the reflection of the macrocosm like a great magic mirror. Because the microcosm is in the macrocosm, and the macrocosm is in the microcosm. Achintya beda bed. We are one and different from the macrocosm. And this beautiful system is going on. The heart is like a great magic mirror, which is catching all of the macrocosmic energies, shaktis, and archetypal patterns, and injecting it like a seed into life through the conscious mind and the brain. Okay, so where are we? <laughs> but it continuous, but is continuous with metamatter in the subtle power field. Uh, or were we? On the other hand, when energy becomes free from the particles at the energy level of matter, a part of it may break the bondage of matter due to the activation of the latent metamatter force, the outer expression of which is material energy, and becomes transformed into metamatter force to function in the subtle power field. Hence, matter does not end at the level of elementary particles, but is continuous with metamatter in the subtle power field. The yogic explanation gives an answer to Hoyle's statement that matter comes from nowhere. This nowhere is the subtle metamatter field, which is beyond all observations, even with the aid of the most sensitive instruments. So when he means when he says metamatter, he means the matter of the matter. The matter of the matter is the mula prakriti. If you go to our Uttama Shakti website, uttamashakti.webpain.com, and you click on um, uh, Siddhanta, and number 5, uh, I believe number 4, Cosmology, it talks about Mula Prakriti. The Mula Prakriti is the cosmic Maya, Maya force of Parabrahman. So this cosmic Maya force of Parabrahman is the originating cause of all of the energy, all of the consciousness, everything that you see in the world around you. This is the metamatter, which is being is is being uh, talked about. The matter of the matter. It steps down in graduated uh, forms, all the way from the above to the below. This mula prakriti, this root of prakriti, and it it steps down all the way to the material world, but all the way through the energy of all of these dimensions has been originating from the same Mula Prakriti, just graduated steps coming down and down and down. So this metamatter force, this pure energy, is what Maya Yoga is tapping into. This Shakti of God Himself. You know, my good friend uh, had a dream of Radha as the Kundalini rising into the crown chakra and meeting Krishna. I thought that that was very beautiful and symbolic and it meant a lot to, to my own practice and what I was doing at the time. Anyway, 
Um, this no, uh, we're continuing. The yogis say that pranic dynamism relates to three forms of energy which give rise to three phenomena. Bhagiman, rarefaction, animan, subtilization, uh, and mahiman, magnification. So they're using alchemical terms here um, to, to describe the three types of energy which are released by pranic dynamism which cause the emergence of the life force, mind, and matter, respectively. The supremely concentrated prana as Bindu PowerPoint. The supremely concentrated prana as Bindu or the PowerPoint becomes expanded and active at a certain critical moment and is expressed as radiant dynamism. Radiant dynamism is transformed into pedaling dynamism consisting of the carefully and centrally situated massive mental consciousness, consciousness around which is the circular pranic force motion and surrounding it is a pedaling formation of an extraordinary character. The whole organization has been technically termed the Shahasrara Chakra. Beautiful. Below the Shahasrara Chakra, three, form, three basic forms of pranic energy coalesce to form a central power flow termed the Shushumna. The Shushumna retains the threefold nature of pranic energy, and so there are three power flows in it. The outer flow is the Shushumna itself, the inner flow is the Vajra flow, and the third, which is inside the Vajra, is the Chitrini flow. So they're saying that as these three lines exhibit their dynamic um, because the Shushumna powerful centripetal force in minds and vertical uh, and uh, vertical uh, motion expressed as centrifugal spiral horizontal force motion the sh and up and down Shushumna Nadi there are three Nadis and they correspond uh, to the three Nadis which are I Super consciousness is the Shumna power flow exhibits two fundamental lives in a circular form at certain points throughout in due course due to the influence of the spiral force motion. Hmm. The centralized circular power follows the pattern of the Shahasra and presents three aspects a central pericarpal formation which is the center of a, a lotus flower is a pericarp, a central pericarpal formation, a circular force motion around it, and a peripheral pedaling formation. The whole circular organization is called a chakra. There are nine named chakras in the Chitrini. Namely, Nirvana, Indu, Manas, Agnya, Vishuddha, Anahata, Manipura, Svadhisthana, and Muladhar. Nine main chakras. Thus the chakras are in the subtle, subtle power field which comprises the mental and metamatter realms. Is this yogic explanation based on pure influence? Uh, inference, sorry. No, the chakras are seen with the mental eye. This requires an explanation. So now we're going to talk about perception. This is good stuff. And I won't take too much longer. Maybe uh, another half hour of talks. And then maybe we could do a little bit of kirtan before we finish it, or meditation. Uh, perception is the process of receiving and being conscious of an object. Perception has several strata. At its lower stratum, physical sense uh, apparatus is involved in perception, 
and there is the awareness of a sense quality in a modified form. There are five main sense qualities, smell, taste, sight, touch, and sound. These qualities are an aspect of matter. The awareness of the sensory form of matter occurs in consciousness. This indicates that sense qualities are outside the boundaries of consciousness. Outside of the boundary of consciousness. And they are brought into consciousness by some appropriate means. This implies that there is a distance factor. Moreover, a penetration of, of sensory forms into consciousness and their, their uh, recognition are based on principles of selection and rejection. If the distance and selection rejection principle were not operating, then all sense qualities would be to stimulate simultaneous content of consciousness. So he's saying that there's a certain process going on of selection and rejection. Otherwise you would just have every sense object in the, the universe would be cognizable to your senses. There's a certain quality of selection and rejection going on. To ensure that you only have a localized experience in the physical world anyway. There are five classes of receptors, each endowed with the power, power of receiving only a particular form of sense quality. After the sense qualities are received by the receptors, sensory paths are created from the receptors, first through the sensory nerves, and then through uh, the neuronal connections in the brain to the cerebral cortex, and thence to an area in the, of the higher brainstem. Nothing more is known about the sensory path and its nervous aspect. For instance, that the end point of the sensory path is in a certain area of the brain which is in connection with consciousness, but this connection does not necessarily indicate that the particular brain area itself is the seat of consciousness, this particular brain area. It may mean that this area is some way connected with consciousness, and when this area is damaged or removed, the connection is cut off. If this brain area is the seat of consciousness, then is consciousness distinct from the brain, or is it identical with the brain? That is, brain equals consciousness. But actually, consciousness has not been traced to any uh, or to that area or to any part of the brain. The sensory path, which has been created, is observable up to the brain. Uh, it is observable because it is a physiochemical process. But how the physiochemical process in that brain area causes the appearance of consciousness is not known. How the metamorphosis of physiochemical energy into consciousness occurs has not been explained. How physiochemical events in the brain suddenly occur as psychic events cannot be explained. Consequently, it cannot be easy to make mind equal brain. There may be another possibility. Uh, psychical events may accompany or immediately follow the physiochemical events in the brain. If this is accepted, then it will mean that their brain, that brain and consciousness are not identical, but are two separate entities, and their interconnection is experienced in a particular brain area. To explain this, it is impostulated that certain specific dynamic actions of the brain in which certain areas of the cerebral cortex and the higher brainstem are involved are essential conditions for the relation between the brain and consciousness. How the specific dynamic actions, which are physiochemical in nature, can establish a relation with consciousness which lies beyond the brain itself is neither known or explained. Molecular, atomic, and subatomic activities are all disconnected from consciousness and are not in fact conscious, are not in fact in consciousness, rather. Molecular, atomic, and subatomic activities are all disconnected from consciousness and are not in fact in consciousness. It is certainly a suggestion that a relation is established between brain and consciousness when the former exhibits specific dynamic actions. If we accept consciousness as something which is neither a physiochemical phenomenon nor explainable in terms of matter, 
then we think of consciousness as something which is outside the sphere of chemical and electrical energy. Something which is neither bound uh, by nor composed of molecules, atoms, nor elementary particles. In that case, the brain consciousness relation is deeper and more complex. There is an important query regarding the specific dynamic action of the brain. How is it caused? If we say that neural neuronal centripetal conductions are the cause, then we have to accept that this brain state is continuous without any interruptions because these, con uh, these conductions are continuous. It has not been demonstrated that there is some controlling mechanism in the brain to exercise control over these conductions. In that case, how is sleep unconsciousness produced? The specific dynamic actions certainly disappear during sleep. What makes them disappear? Here is a clear indication that the specific dynamic action of the brain, if there is any, is not caused by neural neuronal conductions, but something else which might. Um, in the next page, he'll talk about the distance factor operates in senses and sense objects are not situated in direct contact with each other. That's important. But are separated by a certain distance. The distance varies, but there are certain upper and lower limits of perceptions beyond which no perception takes place. Between the upper and lower limits, sensory capacity varies in different species and also in the same species. So he's saying that there are an upper extreme and a lower extreme of sense impulses which you do not perceive. Just like low frequency which you can't perceive. Limit chakras and kundalini and stuff in a minute. However, uh, here the sense capacity also varies in both different species and the same species. There is still another factor. If a sense object remains within the range of the right distance, and his size is also suitable for perception, then there will be uh, then there will be no perception if it is not a, if it is uh, uh, there will be no perception if it is obscured. As an example, if a certain object is placed inside of a closed box situated within the range of vision, then only the box will be seen. Not the object inside of the box. That object has been obscured by the box, which the eyes cannot see through. Other examples are bone covered by muscles, brain covered by skull, etc. The time factor is also operative in perception. Events occur which uh, in the past are only remembered but not seen. Only present events are perceived directly. There is no direct knowledge of future events. All this indicates that sensory capacity is not a fixed thing, but relative, variable, conditional, and temporal. So he's saying that you can perceive a memory which is in the past. So you see that there's a temporal factor to perception. There's no direct knowledge, uh, only present events are perceived directly. There's no direct knowledge of future events. All this indicates that sensory capacity is not a fixed thing, but relative, variable, conditional, and uh, temporal. The sense qualities themselves are also variable. If this is so, we can postulate that there is a possibility of ultimately attaining a perfect and absolute sense capacity, and that the most subtle sensory forms may exist. Can this be actually demonstrated? Let us say that normal sensory capacity is X, right? Now the question is whether we can perceive sense of qualities beyond X or not. Our, our experience is that by using appropriate instruments, we can perceive those sense qualities which are imperceptible at X. The instrumental observations indicate that the barriers of distance, size, and obscurity have been overcome to a considerable extent and that certain ex uh, details and factors which are never seen at X have become visible. Symbolically, we may call this instrumentalized, extended sense capacity Y. This shows that the sensory capacity can be increased beyond the normal limit by instrumental A. So there's different capacities which we can overcome, that's Y. So our normal sense capacity is X, and the capacity we can reach with physical instruments is Y, he's saying. Um, capital Y, capital X, mathematical equation.
This shows that the sensory capacity can be increased beyond the normal limit by instrumental aid, but future events are not revealed by those instruments, these instruments. Now, the question is whether X can be extended to Z without Y. So if, if normal perception can be extended to super perception without any type of technical aid, Z stands for supranormal sensory capacity. It has also gradations. Its existence has been demonstrated by the yogis. Yogic experience may be divided into three categories. First, there is an extension of the normal limit of power without any instrumentation. This may be called extended normal sensory capacity, XA. Those yogis who have been established in pranayam are able to exhibit XA. As for example, there is a tree in front of us at a distance when the normal eyes can see its trunk, branches, and leaves, but not in greater details. If a swarm of ants moves upwards on the surface of the trunk, the ants will not be seen from that distance by normal eyes. But a yogi can see them very clearly. This has been demonstrated. In a similar manner, smell and sound are experienced. Second, there can emerge an uncommon and new pattern of sense qualities which is never experienced by normal sensory power. The specific sense capacity is called XB. <clears throat> A yogi has the capacity XB. He experiences supra, super smell, super sight, and super sound. The following are instances in my own experience. I was sitting in a position on my seat in a very dark room on a very dark night. Fully awake but calm. There was no motion of seeing or hearing anything uncommon. I spent about an hour like this. Then suddenly I saw a beautiful light of vermilion color by which the whole room was lit up. I got up amazed and looked up at the light for some minutes. The light was very beautiful, cool, and localized, and the room was beautifully illuminated. I went outside to see if anything had happened there, but found nothing. I hastened into my room and saw the light was still glittering. After ten minutes or so, the light gradually became dim and finally disappeared. The room was again dark. I saw this light with my eyes, which were neither closed nor covered. In my judgment, it was a super light. And this is very interesting. Pay attention to this one. This is cool. Another experience that I had. The other experience I had was, I happened to be in a place where a room was given to me to sleep in, which had on the wall a beautiful picture of Sri Chaitanya. A beautiful picture of Sri Chaitanya, the great Bhakti Yoga Master. One dark night, the room being also very dark, I was sitting, I was in a sitting attitude, calm but awake. When about 30 minutes had passed, I suddenly saw to my great surprise that very bright yellow rays were radiating from the body of Chaitanya in the picture. The whole picture was beautifully illuminated and even part of the room was lit up. Before this occurrence, I had not thought at all of the picture. I was fully awake at the time. The light phenomena continued for five to ten minutes. In those days, I was able to see clearly and minutely things in deep darkness without the help of light. Oh, interesting, huh? Yes. Third, there are real supranormal sensory perceptions Z perception, in which the barriers of distance, size, obscurity, and time are completely overcome. So now we're, we're asking, how is it that these factors uh, of time, you know, space, sound, how can all of these things be overcome by the yogi? yogi? How is the yogi able to overcome all of these uh, apparent barriers and, and how is he able to do this without even usage of his physical senses is the question 
There are real supranormal sensory perceptions, Z perception, in which the barriers of distance, time, obscurity, and time, uh, distance, excuse me, distance size, obscurity, and time are completely overcome. A yogi can perceive a happening occurring far away from him and buried by mountains, uh, barriered by mountains, building, etc. He can correctly foretell future events. All this has been demonstrated. So the position is this. The gross aspect of matter presents sense qualities in a form which may be termed sense in sensory form one. It is perceived by normal sensory capacity, that is, X capacity. The range of normal sensory capacity can be increased to a degree when the perceptions of sense qualities lying beyond the normal sensory limit occurs. <clears throat> uh, to a degree when, this, when the perception of sense qualities lying beyond the normal sensory limit occurs. The sense qualities do not change at this stage, uh, but are barriered, which is overcome by extended normal sensory capacity, XA capacity. We also find that the patterns of the sensory qualities perceived by normal sensory capacity and extended normal sensory capacity is associated with a new or an altered form of sense qualities, which is only perceived by specific sensory capacity, that is, XB capacity. Above all these is the sensory form 2, which is perceived uh, by instrumentalized extended sensory capacity, that is, Y capacity. Thereafter, there is a gap in the perception of sense qualities at the subatomic level. There is no records of any sensory experience at this stage known to me, but theoretically there is no reason why this should be impossible. <clears throat> the supranormal sensory experience develops after the specific sensory experience. In this experience, sensory form 1 is perceived, but sensory form 1 is concealed by the barriers of distance, size, obscurity, and time. In this perception, these barriers are overcome by developing a supranormal sensory capacity, that is, Z capacity. What is the mechanism which is brought into play in the above forms of perception? In normal sensory perception, the receptors are stimulated and sensory nervous paths are created uh, which join the appropriate brain areas. In extended normal perception, sensory, specific sensory perception, and instrumentalized sensory perception, the same receptor brain nervous paths are used. But in supranormal sensory perception, the nervous paths are not used because the, the receptors cannot be stimulated by sensory form 1, which is obscured by the barriers of distance, size, obscurity, and time. In that case, how does this form of perception take place? It indicates that the quote-unquote wired nervous paths are too gross for this kind of perception. And since this perception is a fact, there, may, there must be some subtle quote-unquote wireless conduction system for this purpose. These non-nervous subtle conduction lines are technically termed naughty paths. When the pranic forces are roused, and become more concentrated by pranayam and concentration, they can be made so sensitive that they receive the vibrations, motions, or radiations of the sense qualities, uh, even when these are obscured. The endpoints of pranic force in the head and skin of the body uh, receive the refined sensory vibrations and transmit them to the chakras from where the sense qualities are transmitted to the subconscious mind in the Agnya Chakra. Precognition is only affected by the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind, when it is sensitized by pranayama, uh, where the subconscious mind is able to receive directly all sense qualities, when it is sensitized by pr pranayama and concentration, excuse me, um, Okay, so let's see... I'm almost finished with this chapter, so let's just finish this chapter and then... Um, kirtan. Then we'll do Kirtan. 
Supranormal perception indicates the existence of subtle naughty paths. It also shows that consciousness is outside the boundary of the brain. Most people are unable to utilize these paths because their powers in this direction are undeve underdeveloped. Undeveloped. The neural neuronal paths of conduction occurring in common sensory perception stop at certain points in the brain. These are the endpoints of the gross brain paths. The sensory qualities conveyed by sensory conduction are released from the nervous envelopment of these at these brain points and are received and conveyed by pranic forces to the nadi field and then to the subconscious mechanism from where they are radiated to consciousness. It appears that brain dynamism is an aspect of pranic dynamism and mental dynamism extends through pranic dynamism to the brain. The sensory forms are a series of graduated forms. On the lower scale, the sensory forms are gross, and as they ascend the scale, they become more and more minute. Sensory capacity also changes and become increasingly powerful in the perception of more minute sense forms. Our normal sensory capacity can be extended to perceive not only sense qualities lying beyond the normal, but also new types of sense quality, a new type of sense qualities. Minute sensory forms existing in the internal form of matter as molecules and atoms are perceived by the electron microscope. Both, but sensory forms existing at the subatomic levels are so minute that they cannot even be perceived by the use of the electron microscope. This does not indicate that sensory forms are non-existent here. The sensory forms continue from the atomic subatomic level to extend to the subtle metamatter state. So now he's talking about a, a spread of dimensionality from the matter state that we know to the metamatter, the matter of matter state. Minute sensory forms existing in the internal form of matter as molecules and atoms are perceived by the electron microscope, but sensory forms existing at the subatomic levels are so minute that they cannot even be perceived by the use of an electron microscope. This does not indicate that sensory forms are non-existent here. The sensory forms continue from the atomic subatomic level and extend to the subtle metamatter, metamatter stage. At the metamatter stage, sensory forms are subtle and exist as subtle smell, taste, sight, touch, and sound, isolated from each other. They are the fundamental aspects of metamatter. The Mahabhutas are reducible to the most concentrated forces called Tanmatras. Mahabhuta means uh, uh, a great element like earth, water, fire, air as a Mahabhuta, they are reduced, as it says here, reducible to the most concentrated forms called Tanmatra sense objects. At the Tanmatra level, sensory forms are the subtlest, and these are the perfect and final forms. Beyond this point, there are no sensory forms. It is the borderland of sense form. For the perception of these subtle phenomena, it requires perfect quote-unquote nose, tongue, eye, ear, skin, and quote-unquote ear. This means that it is the final and most perfect sensory experience which must only be which can only be achieved by the yogic mental eye, the third eye. It is a super-conscious perception and consciousness elevated to the concentration level it is the only apparatus for this attainment. This perception has two levels beyond perception and samadhi perception. The former develops into the latter. Beyond perception and then samadhi perception. Dhyan means concentration, samadhi means super concentration. Um, dhyan is a state of consciousness which the body becomes completely motionless like a mountain. The senses of smell, taste, sight, uh, touch, and sound become inoperative. And consequently, the outer world is no longer the content of consciousness. Consciousness remains unaffected by intellective functions and thoughts. Such consciousness, thus being empty, coils to a point in which all its power is in full concentration. Oh, that's one of the greatest quotes from this little spiel that we've been having. 
constant when the consciousness is empty, it coils to a point, to a bindu, to a point in super concentration where this power is exhibited. Interesting, yes. Coils like a snake, snake power. Uh, where are we? I love that. That's great. Um, so when it, it says here that the outer world is no longer the content of consciousness, that means that the inner world is the content of consciousness. After this dhyan and samadhi effect, you know, your focus on the internal Lord is so experiential. You, when, when someone perceives you, they look straight and they, all you are is a mirror catching the rays of the radiant Lord. That's all that you are at that stage. And so there's no room for, you know, BDSM, gay, you know, sex with your disciples. And there's no room for all this shenanigans and stuff. There's no room for all of this. Because you were being super concentration. And is this sectarian? No. This is just what is. It's neither sectarian or non-sectarian. It's just what is. You know, the sectarian only in interest exists in relation to the non-sectarian. So in, rea in reality, there's just what is. You can make a sectarian kind of expression out of it, but it becomes bad kind of sectarian when it's there's fear involved. When there's fear involved, so much fear involved, it becomes a bad kind, but either way. So this super concentration, this samadhi, is the name of the game. This is it. When samadhi happens, then real bhakti. You can do real bhakti from your heart. Moving in samadhi is bhakti. Okay, so anyway, the outer world is no longer the content of consciousness. Consciousness remains unaffected by intellective functions and thoughts. So your, your consciousness is no longer being ensnared by your mind. And it rises above to the superconscious samadhi platform. And you actually, it's like the, the material world and your, your, your physical, you know, your physical, you know, your physical, but your subtle mental intellect. Whereas before, it was this strong force which was controlling your consciousness and your emotions and making you out of whack and all haywire, and you felt bad one second and great the next second, all this duality, up and down, up and down. When samadhi happens, you become monopolar, you become just locked within absorptive concentration. You know, things go up and down, you may not be in that all the time, but it gets to a point, <coughs> it gets to a point where it's so easy for you to enter that absorptive concentration. You only need to close your eyes and take a breath and you're there in samadhi. So nothing ever really gets the best of you. I mean, you have different emotions. You're not a robot. You're not just stuck in this mode. But it becomes a background. It becomes a foundation. And this is power. This is a power for your spiritual life. Okay, so... Unaffected by intellective functions, this power grounds you and it makes you so you're not uh, not affected by intellective functions, the serpent power and the kundalini. You're no longer, you know, tossed here and there by the mind, but instead you're grounded completely within the realization, really realization, real realization, not just an intellectual realization, but a real deep one, a deep spiritual realization. Okay. Um, the co such consciousness thus being empty coils to a point in which all its power is in full concentration. In this state, concentration exhibits the power of holding one object fully, Ishta Devata. When such a concentration, concentrated consciousness is exposed to an object, it penetrates into the deeper aspect of the object and gets its inner subtle power graph properly imaged in consciousness. And the image is fully illumined, illuminated because of the revealing quality of consciousness is now maximally roused. Then consciousness expands to a certain degree for the magnification of the image of the power graph, which finally is transferred to a highly rarefied thought. So now they're talking about the, the process of meditation upon the Ishta Devata. You meditate on the Ishta Devata and it becomes highly rarefied, alive thought, which is an offering and a connection. 
a highly rarefied thought uh, in the uh, in this way, a perfect and complete knowledge of the unknown and the subtle aspect of an object is attained. Complete knowledge of the unknown and subtle aspects of any object. You can meditate on anything and you'll receive this, this knowledge, whether it's Ishtadeva or otherwise. <clears throat> Samadhi is the full extension of Dhyan when the perception is absolute and automatic. That's a good definition. Samadhi is the full extension of Dhyan when the perception is absolute and automatic. The chakras have been seen in this manner. Is the mental vision of subtle phenomena a fact? Are the subtle phenomena real? Our answer is that the chakras are subtle but not imaginary. Each chakra contains specific power and phenomena which can be made to manifest physically by the appropriate means. This fact clearly indicates that the chakras exist and their powers can be made to manifest themselves on the physical plane. Let us take the Muladhar chakra for example. The power Apana, which is one of the five pranas, Apana, residing in the Muladhar chakra, can be roused, controlled, and made to exhibit a strong upward motion by the Dhyan and Pranayam. When this upward Apana motion is most forceful, the physical body rises off the ground and begins to levitate by itself without any mechanical aid. There is no form of energy. Uh, there is no form of energy operating in the body which is able to do this in the physical body. Consequently, it definitely manifests in the existence of the chakra. It definitely manifests the existence of the chakra, the pranic power, and its influence on the body. There are other forms of powers in the chakras. Uh, they can be roused by Dhyan. Dhyan in the Muladhar develops natural health and strength of the body and intellective power and prolongs life. Dhyan in the Svadhisthana chakra can develop a diseaselessness and vital body and intellectual power. Dhyan in the Manipur chakra can develop natural immunity and the body attainment of long life and the release of certain uncommon powers. Develop, uh, Dhyan in the Anahata heart chakra develops inner beauty and makes the body highly attractive. There is also an intellectual development above normal and an acquisition of uncommon sensory powers. Dhyan in the Vishuddha Chakra develops a body adamantine in hardness and strength and absorptive mental concentration. All these phenomena indicate that the chakra powers can be made to manifest in the body.